Bonjour. This brief presentation of Bayes' theorem will serve as an introduction to a very large field of scientific research that uses the concept of Bayesian inference. The term Bayesian inference may seem barbaric to you, but you will see that you have been practicing Bayesian inference since you were a child. Here are closed candy boxes. If you open them, you will see that some contain candies, others do not. We color all the boxes with a nice purple or green color. If you looked carefully, you would have noticed that the boxes containing candies are rather purple, but not all, some are green. And you also noticed that most of the empty boxes are green, except for a few that are purple. Now we close all the boxes. Mix them up so we don't remember where the candies are. And now I want you to pick a box. I guess you will choose a purple box because you know there is a higher chance to find candies inside. Whereas if you hadn't seen the open boxes, you would pick a box randomly. By doing this, you are practicing a typical Bayesian choice. At the very beginning of the experiment, the probability of finding a box with candies was less than 50%. But knowing that the probability of the candy being packaged in a purple box is high, and that, on the other hand, it is less likely than a purple box is empty, it is inferred that you have more chances to draw a box full of candies if you choose a purple box. This probability can be calculated, and for this we will take another similar but more epidemiological example. Here is a group of 120 subjects who complain of being sick. In reality, only 25 of them are really ill. They are colored in red and 95 of them are not ill, they are colored in blue. Each subject undergoes a biological test. Among the ill, 21 are positive and 4 are negative. And among the not ill, most of them are negative, except 8 colored here in dark blue. Here are the results of all the tests. Presented this way, it's a little hard to read. So let's summarize the results in a table. We know that there are 25 ill out of 120 subjects, so the frequency of the disease can be considered as an a priori probability of being ill, which is here 21%. Among all the subjects, 29 have a positive test, and among them, 21 are ill and 8 are not ill. So there are 72% of ill among positive, this frequency can be considered as the posteriori probability of being ill. So despite the imperfections of the test, we have improved the probability of the disease from 21% to 72%. But all these calculations are only possible because I have shown you who was ill and who was not ill. But in real life, we don't know who is ill. A doctor faces a single patient with for instance, a positive test, and needs to answer the patient's question, am I sick? How liable is this positive result? This is where Bayes' theorem comes to the rescue. The question asked is, what is the probability of being ill if the test is positive? Let's call A the fact of being ill and B the fact of having a positive result to the test. So the question asked is, what is the conditional probability of A if B is present? This is the A posteriori probability of the previous slide. You will have to call upon some memories of your high school classes. Let A and B be two probabilities of independent events whose value can be represented by the two colored areas. The probability of A can be represented by the ratio of the blue colored area divided by the whole universe of possibilities omega. Similarly, the probability of B can be represented by the ratio of the red area to the omega universe. We see that the probability of A given B in dark red is represented by the intersection of the two surfaces. This intersection surface is a part of the probability B. So the part of the area of A inside B is equal to the area of the intersection of A with B divided by the area of B. This is about a quarter of the area of B. So we have probability of A given B equals probability of A intersection B divided by the probability of B. 
but we could have done the opposite demonstration and look for the probability of B given A. This probability is represented by the intersection of A and B colored in dark blue. This part is equal to about half of the area of A. And so we have probability of B given A equals probability of A intersection B divided by the probability of A. Here we join the two formulas we just found. We make a small inversion in each formula, which allows us to see that we have two expressions for the same value of probability of A intersection B. We can therefore write that P of A given B multiplied by P of B is equal to P of B given A multiplied by P of A, which is the beginning of Bayes' theorem. This can be quickly verified with the data in our example. Probability of A, of, or probability of being ill, 25 divided by 120 subject, equals 0 0.208. Probability of the sign being positive, 29 times out of 120 tests, equals 0 0.242. Probability of being ill with a positive test, the probability of B given A, is 21 positive ill divided by 25 ill, which equals 0.84. This is the sensitivity of the test, or the ability of the test to identify an ill. The probability of A given B, the probability of being ill, if the test is positive, 21 positive ill divided by 29 positive tests, equals 0.724. I leave it to you to check these equality 0.724 multiplied by 0.242 equals to 0.84 multiplied by 0.208. And now you're ready to appreciate this Bayes theorem which derives from the formula we just found. P of A given B is equal to the ratio of P of A divided by P of B multiplied by P of B given A. This formula is extraordinary. It is probably the most important of all probability theory. It has revolutionized probabilistic reasoning. What does it tell us? The probability of A given B is a conditional probability. It is the probability of A knowing B, so it is an A posteriori probability. The probability of A is the global probability of A independently of B, before knowing B. It is thus an a priori probability. So this theorem tells us that an a posteriori probability can be calculated from an a priori probability knowing some parameters. This formula, quite simple, however presents some difficulties. In our example, notice that to calculate the probability of being ill if the test is positive, we need three terms. P of A is the probability of being ill, in other words, the prevalence of the disease. It can be known a priori. P of B given A is the capacity of the test to detect patients, thus its sensitivity. The remaining P of B is the probability of the test being positive. Let's see how we can find it. We must return to our Venn diagrams. We can say that the probability of B is the sum of the probability of A into section B plus the probability of not A into section B. We saw earlier how to obtain P of A into section B. And in the same way, we can obtain P of not A into section B, which e equals to P of B given not A multiplied by P of not A. We can therefore write P of B, which is the sum of both terms. And so, replace P of B by this value in the denominator of base formula, and thus obtain a developed formula, which is absolutely impossible to remember, but which, which has a major advantage. Now, in our example, we know all the values of the right term. We know the prevalence we know the prevalence P of A and its inverse P of not A.
we know P of B given A, which is the sensitivity of the test. P of B given not A is the probability of false positive, so it is 1 minus the specificity. Sensitivity and specificity are intrinsic qualities of the test that we know because they are displayed by the test's manufacturer. Knowing the a priori prevalence of the disease, 20.8%, the sensitivity of the test, 84%, and its specificity, 91.6%, we can deduce the probability of being ill if the test is positive, which is 72.4%. In diagnosis, this probability is called the positive predictive value of the test. I suggest you take a look at the video called Screening to get more information on the subject. To finish, I will come back to this formula, which tells us that an a posteriori probability can be calculated from an a priori probability. For example, knowing that in a given country it rains one day out of four, I won't tell you where not to offend anyone, and knowing the probability of rain or no rain when dark clouds gather on the horizon, we can estimate the probability of rain today if we see clouds coming. Meteorologists do the same estimations, but with data a little more sophisticated than clouds. The way of thinking can be seen as follows. Through the prism of an event B, one modifies the perception of a situation that one knew a priori. Event B enriches this knowledge and acts as a kind of magnifying glass. Event B is the result of an observation, an experiment, a series of measurements that modify the a priori probability. This type of reasoning, which is called Bayesian inference, is inductive. Asserting the probability of A given B is making an inference. Bayes' theorem has many fields of application. We have seen it in the calculation of predictive values for a diagnostic test, a screening method, or even a population alert system. It is used in the construction of decision trees, but its application in the fields of modeling and research is in full development because what is called Bayesian inference make it, makes it possible to go further in the exploration of chains of events. To give you a simple example of a Bayesian reasoning, let's take an example, a little simplistic, but which shows how to take into account probabilities in a Bayesian type of reasoning. A young teenager is brought to the doctor by his parents for a sudden onset of diarrhea. This boy is otherwise in good health. What are the diagnostic hypotheses? First of all, the mother, very anxious, who spent her evening on the internet to look for all the causes of diarrhea, thinks that it is the beginning of a Crohn's disease, a serious intestinal disease. The father, more casual, attributes this symptom to the catastrophic mark obtained by his son in his statistics exam. The doctor, first of all, evokes the possibility of food poisoning. Of course, many other things can be mentioned, but we will stop here. All these hypotheses are a priori probabilities. A priori of the mother, a priori of the father, a priori of the doctor. Event B is the diarrhea whose significance is more or less relevant. In statistical terms, this relevance is called likelihood. It is the combination of the intrinsic qualities of sensitivity and specificity of the symptom. What we are looking for is the probability of the suggested hypothesis in the presence of diarrhea. This a posteriori probability P of H given D is proportional to the a priori probability multiplied by the likelihood of the symptom. You recognized here our base paradigm. Let's start with Crohn's disease. It is a rare disease with an incidence of about 1 per 10,000. But what this mother did note is that the likelihood of seeing diarrhea in, in Crohn's disease is very high. In fact, it is one of the major symptoms. The likelihood is therefore very high. But in the end, the product of both factors is small and the probability of the Crohn's hypothesis is low, especially since this boy has no other symptoms compatible with this pathology. 
Second hypothesis, the failure of the exam. The frequency of exam failures in this teenager who makes the despair of his father is high, but the probability of diarrhea following a failed exam, while not impossible, is highly doubtful. Finally, the probability of this hypothesis is negligible. As for food poisoning, it is very frequent, and the likelihood of the symptom is of course very high. Ultimately, the probability of the food poisoning hypothesis in the presence of this diarrhea will be privileged for complementary research and treatment. The mother will be reassured and the father will be told to take it easy with his boy. But let's be careful. This is a probabilistic type of reasoning. It does not allow us to affirm causality. Perhaps there is another cause for this diarrhea. One could simply say that the doctor is not necessarily right, but that he is somehow more right than the teenager's parents. In conclusion of this brief presentation, you have probably noticed that Bayesian reasoning is extremely widespread, from young children in their first months of life to researchers in cognitive science. Perhaps you feel shipwrecked in this ocean of theory with a very low probability of getting out. But be aware of the signs that will tell you that you are going in the right direction. And I invite you to watch an upcoming video dealing more specifically with Bayesian inference. Merci et au revoir.